morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, it's Good Friday next week or this week, right? You know we're having a Good Friday service? Yeah, you should come. You should totally come. Invite someone, bring them. A little communion, a little worship, a little family-style service, a sweet message that I'm pretty excited about as our new... Uh, Youth Minister Jose is delivering it. Pretty exciting stuff. This Friday, 7 p.m., come with the whole family. It's going to be sweet. Again, you have flyers to invite those who will come and those who will not come. Give them to them anyway. Just, just take it. Just take it. You know, you never know. You may want to come. Just, just take it, you can say. Pass those out. Make sure that we're uh, giving the Lord opportunity to call uh, hearts to come in and hear the gospel. It's Evangelism Sunday. Can you say that out loud? Evangelism Sunday. Let's take the opportunity. Good morning. Glad you're here. There's lots of ways you can be involved in the ministry that's going to take place next Sunday. You can see one of the sign-up sheets in the foyer. Bring a dish to share, as it is a potluck-style good church tradition, right? A little bit of everything. The church will be providing through some sweet saints the meat, that which brings us together, the center of our plates. Good morning. I'm feeling real hammy today, so as a meat pun, you get that? You get that? Little, little, good morning. A little hammy today, so if you're not awake or appreciating that, I apologize in advance. Good times next Sunday. Let's pray and prepare for the Lord to use it greatly. Revelation chapter 9. As we continue our course, you may find it strange that you're opening your Bible to Revelation chapter 11. Did I say 9? Yeah, it's 11. But you, you know better. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You read your Bibles. You're paying attention. Revelation 11, not 9. We were there two weeks ago. But if you do find that strange... Uh, we are studying verse by verse through the New Testament, and so generally one chapter at a time, although that's not going to happen this morning, as we saw for service, but generally a chapter at a time, we're working our way through the New Testament, and here we are, verse 1 of Revelation 11. This is called one of the most difficult to teach and translate chapters in the entire Bible, so God be with you. God help me. Good morning. Good morning. There's going to be a lot of that, guys. So uh, I pray we brought our thinking caps. The title that we've attached to this text, Inspecting, Evaluating, and Awakening to Opportunity. Lord, help us. Lord, be with us as we seek to study your timeless, pure, perfect, holy word. We thank you that you said every word of the Lord is perfect. Lord, help us just to sit still and revel in that for a minute. This Bible that we hold in our hands is not ours, it's yours. We don't have the freedom to change it or adapt it or to expound much on it, but just to take it as it reads according to what you say and seek to understand it. Would your word reign supreme in our lives as believers in these last days? Lord, we do live in an age where men seem to do what's right in their own eyes. We've got philosophies we claim to have understanding or experience. But Lord, you sum us all up together in just that rebellious and dysfunctional way that we can often can be. Lord, we thank you that you've given us a sword of the Spirit, as we said last Sunday. And there are portions of the Word that are sweet like honey. We love them, Lord. Promises, blessings prophecies, Lord, that are just preparing us and causing us to just long for eternity. Perfection in heaven with you, but there are parts that are sharp, and they cut. And Lord, help us to embrace these portions as well. Lord, as you call us to be a people that represent you to this lost world that you're longing to save. Work on us today. Lord, we don't want to leave the same way we came. We're not here to just be encouraged to stay 
in the same condition, but we're here to be changed and transformed and to grow up in you. And so, Lord, would you accomplish all these things and so much more as we simply read, as we simply study. Lord, a lot of complex prophecy here, but in all of it, we see your glory, Lord. And so would your people see an almighty God who is perfect and pure, who has a compassionate heart to to reach rebellious, lost, hard hearts. A God who's never wrong, who speaks words that sometimes we just don't understand, and yet they always come to pass. Lord, would you be magnified? We pray together right now. Lord, be magnified in our minds and hearts today, just bigger. We want you to be bigger, Lord bigger than we've ever seen, bigger than you've ever been in our eyes before. Be bigger today. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people, God. Those who are here, those who are watching and listening, Lord, we think of so many precious faces and tender hearts, Lord. Be with them today. Impart your blessing, Lord. We give you praise and glory and honor. Let's say together in Jesus' name. Amen. Someone said this, it's on the screen. Humanity has had its day and the opportunity to do what it wants. However, there will be a day when God steps in and makes it his day. Can you say those two words? During the tribulation period, he will demonstrate, listen, the folly of placing all our stock in the here and now. I pray we're awake to that truth today. Uniformity, this author said, is the worldly teaching that everything continues the same as it's always been from the beginning with no major change. The tribulation. Haven't we seen this to be true, those of you that have been with us? We've seen the Lord progressively reveal this all-important truth. This author says the tribulation will eliminate this belief as the Lord steps in and makes it his day. Chapters 6 through 19, if you haven't been with us, we've been studying this section of the book of Revelation. It's called the day of the Lord, the great tribulation. It's described in this manner, a day of wrath in which the wrath of God that's been stored up for a long time. Where is God and why does God allow and how could he and how come he doesn't? All those why questions we've talked about get answered. They are answered. This period of time is the answer as the Lord begins to pour out long stored up wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. But many of us know this, and many even unsaved believers have heard that. Oh, the wrath of God, wrath of God, wrath of God. That's all true. It's real, it's right, and it's coming. But the Great Tribulation isn't just all about the wrath of God, amen? In every single chapter that we've studied thus far, we've seen the mercy of God abounding, the grace of the Lord still extended. And though, you know, we would say the door is closed and the the time is over, God is still extending the opportunity to salvation to those who have rejected Jesus Christ their their whole lives. They're in the, the, the fire, as it were. Things are happening all around them, and yet with every single judgment, radical judgment that we've talked about, the seals are open, the trumpets are blast, and we're not done yet. But in every single one of them, we still see the opportunity for those that are on the earth to repent and proclaim Jesus Christ as both their Savior and Lord. And both of those are so important and essential. This is a period of judgment. We're not going to lessen it. It's radical. It's righteous. But it's also a period in which we see God putting pressure on people more than he ever has before, at least according to our sight and understanding, right? You know what I'm talking about. You watch the Lord in regard to those that know him and those who don't. You watch the Lord work in their life, and oftentimes he puts that pressure, doesn't he? Just the right amount, never too much. And sometimes some need more than others. You with me? He puts that pressure, and you're like, man, wake up, dude. Repent, sister. I mean, how much more heavy can the hand of God get? Pretty heavy, right? The Lord's placing pressure upon those who are on the earth 
turning their hearts to repentance. We see a righteous God, a gracious God, doing everything short of compelling or forcing people to choose Jesus. He seems to take them to that point and to that place. It's sovereign, it's powerful, it's packed with all kinds of you know, lessons for us in our lives and ministry today. The most refreshing point um, that I've pulled personally from Revelation in our study thus far is that mercy of God, and we see it all around us, don't we? I hope we do. I hope you do. Do we? Revelation 11, verse 1. If you'll take a few notes as we introduce this chapter, again, we're in the midst of the Great Tribulation, but chapter 11 is quite distinct. It's quite different. As we talked about last Sunday in chapter 10, we're in a second period of pause. Uh, crazy, cataclysmic, demonic, all kinds of activities and judgments are falling upon planet Earth. But with each radical outpouring... There's a period of pause, and we noted that last time. Listen to that message. Here comes chapter 11, and chapter 11 directs our attention to the primary people that God is working with in the Great Tribulation. And, and who are they? The nation of? Thank you. That one person. A lot of audience participation today. The nation of Israel. If you're thinking to yourself as a Gentile, well, I'll just wait until the church is raptured and until the great tribulation begins and all this crazy stuff's happening. And then when I see it, I'll choose Christ. Good luck. Right? Good luck. If you live, don't think that it will be easy. Understand, there's opportunity for Gentiles like us to repent to be saved during the Great Tribulation. But it's pretty unlikely. The primary people that God is turning his attention toward as the Great Tribulation or the Day of the Lord is called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's not us, that's Israel, right? You know that. The Lord is turning his attention, and we see that chapter 11. Write this down in your bulletin. Chapter 11 is all about Israel. We see three things in this chapter that we won't fully cover. God bless you. We'll pick it up, I'm sure, somewhere along the lines next week. But we see the predominant focus of this chapter is firstly the Jewish people. Write that down. The city of Jerusalem and the temple. It's not there now, but it will be rebuilt one day, in fact. We see that prophetically in this chapter. So those three things help us to digest and understand what's taking place in Revelation 11. And there's lots of great applications for us along the way as the word of God is never, never fruitless. It never returns void. And I pray we see that this morning. Verse 1, Revelation 11. Can you give me an amen for that? John says, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod. For John, that would be a reed uh, about 9 to 10 feet tall. You can make this contemporary. It's like our Stanley measuring tape. You know what I'm saying? Men, you know what I'm saying? I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, rise and measure, underline these couple of phrases, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, the sacrifices, of course, that take place there, and we'll talk about this. And thirdly, measure those who worship there. Measurement. Can you write that down and maybe think this through for just a minute? It's a concept that's seen constantly over and over again in the Old Testament, and it's something that we can observe and learn a lot about. Here's a couple of verses. Write them down if you would. Ezekiel 40 through 43, Amos chapter 7, we see again the temple measured in that portion of scripture, Zechariah chapter 2, write that down, we see a man who's probably an angel measuring the city of Jerusalem, and it's not positive in that scene or story, it's preparation for judgment, God's going to judge his people Israel for their idolatry, and so on and so forth. In Revelation 21, write that down, Revelation 21, we see 
Our future home, the new city of Jerusalem, this one that we're reading about here, praise God, is done, it's over, it's going to be destroyed, wrapped up like a scroll along with the rest of the earth and chucked into the cosmic garbage can or whatever. Good morning. And the new city of Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth that God creates just like this. And John measures it, gives dimension to it. It's radical, it's, you know thought-provoking and, and super cool uh, to consider. A lot of portions of Scripture that impart this idea of measurement. One Bible student accurately said this. Listen, here's the idea. Measurement speaks of ownership and evaluation of a condition. Can we read that out loud together? Measurement speaks of ownership and evaluation of a condition. One more passage, Habakkuk 3, verse 6. Habakkuk speaks and he says in regard to the Lord, he stood and measured the earth. Again, measurement speaks of ownership and evaluation of a condition. In that passage in Habakkuk, it's powerful. The Lord is exercising authority. He says, I know all about you and I can do whatever I want with you. I know everything about you. I'm going to evaluate you, and I'm going to do whatever I choose to with you. We serve, and aren't you thankful to remember, a sovereign God? It's one of the themes of the book of Revelation. It's not like four-faced creatures and stuff like that. That's a Revelation joke, amen? One of the great themes of the book of Revelation is the sovereignty of God. Crazy things are happening. Chapter 9, demons are running loose, or so it seems. It's terrifying. It's terrible. But in every single chapter we've seen thus far that God is in control. God is sovereign. God is on the throne. He has a plan, and it will always, life will always go according to that perfect plan. We'll never see anything else. That provides such assurance. It builds faith. It helps me to say in my present life today, okay, things seem crazy. I'm suffering. I'm hurting. I don't like this. I'm trying to do right, and yet everything wrong seems to be happening. Remember, the Lord is on the throne. The Lord is sovereign. He has a plan, and yes, he loves you. His affection hasn't changed for you. His promises have never failed. That voice you hear in your ear, it's a lie. Don't listen to it. He's never failed. He's never not kept his word. Always has and always will. And that's called walking by faith. Amen? I'm thankful that we can see that lesson so clearly biblically. So with all that in mind having that Old Testament kind of foundation or basis in view. Let's read this again. John is commanded to rise and measure the temple of God, the altar. And thirdly, lastly, this is relevant before we move on, those who worship there. The first two kind of make sense, right? Measure the temple of God, okay, the altar, well, all right, we'll talk about that later. But lastly, this part I don't like so much. How about you? Evaluate, John, exercise authority over those who worship there. Sometimes we like to think of our worship as art, right? And maybe it is. Well, this is just my particular expression or, or outlet or form, or it's my own art to Jesus. I think there's something there that can be true. But the Lord directs us how to worship. He tells us what worship is in the scripture. Aren't you thankful for that? I worship God by sitting in a field and saying, um, on Sunday mornings. That's my artistic expression of worship. Barefoot, of course, you know, because that's how that works. Well, that's really nice. That's, that's really nice for you. But, you know, the Lord kind of teaches us what worship is, and he actually directs us in how we are to worship him in the Bible. You see, there's biblical instruction as to what worship is. There's a foundation. God says, this is what worship is to me, and that's not. And that's nice for you, but it's not for me, the Lord says. Do you know, Christian, that the Lord evaluates your worship? 
Do you know that? That's a powerful thought. We don't hear much about that today, do we? That's not popular. It's kind of thought-provoking and maybe even a little scary. Every single time you offer worship to the Lord, as we read in Revelation 1, he who has eyes like a flame of fire, he sees right through you. Past the outward performances, the, you know, kneeling down and the prostration or the hands raised in elevation or whatever. And all that's fine. But he sees past through the outward and he sees inward to the heart. And I'm so thankful that our Lord teaches us over and over again in Scripture that it's predominantly, worship predominantly is all about sincerity. Can you write that down? Our worship is predominantly all about sincerity. I love that. Someone said, the Gospel of Mark, or in the Gospel of Mark, we read that one day Jesus observed the worship at the temple and watched how people put money into the temple treasury. What a thing. God watches how you give too, doesn't he? And this author said, we must realize God is always our observer and our audience. He watches our attitudes as well as our actions. Write this down, would you? Luke chapter 18. We're going to have a lot of references this morning that we just don't have time to read. That's your homework. I pray you do that. We can simply encourage you to read your Bible and hope and pray that you do, but if you don't, well, you just won't be blessed. So, a little church joke. Luke 18, Jesus teaches a parable there, and he gives us his perspective kind of on the sanctuary scene, right? How valuable would such a perspective be? And he talks about two men. One man who comes in and says, oh, God, thank you that, you know, I tithe. Isn't that cool? You know, I, I give 10%, and, and I'm not like that guy over there. In fact, you know, I'm clean, and I'm holy, and pff, he's stinky and dirty and sinful, and I saw him last week, and I know about this, and I'm just so thankful that I'm so much better, and da-da-da-da-da. And then you've got the other perspective that Jesus sees or saw, the man who says he's beating his chest, and he says, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. You know, I'm paraphrasing here a little bit. Jesus said, that's the guy who went away justified. Who wants to be justified before the Lord? Raise your hand. Let's do that, you know. I want to be just, just as if I'd never sinned. I want to be seen in that light before the Lord. And we gain that, we access that through the gift of Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. It's Easter time, folks. By trusting in his body and blood, his death and resurrection, I am justified. He's got the good, I don't. I'll never be good enough. I'll never be like God enough to have a relationship with him, to be right with him. I can't dwell where he dwells because I'd be consumed. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. God, forgive me, Lord, and thank you that you will forgive me and accept me through your son. That exchange that takes place, powerful and important, Pretense is nothing to the Lord. Do we know this? The God who evaluates our worship, like it or not, he sees with eyes like a flame of fire. And our outward posture, our King James dialogue, you don't do this, do you? A piece of advice. Don't use the word bestow in prayer. And Lord, just bestow upon us. If you do that, I don't know. I'm not talking about you. I'm totally joking, okay? totally joking. So if you do that, God bless you. The Lord loves you. Just heads up, you know. The Lord doesn't talk in King James. You know the Bible that wasn't written in King James? Do you know that? That's, a, that's another church joke relevant for another time. But at any rate, it's not our words. It's not our posture. It's the sincerity of our heart. Now, I think posture is not oftentimes important. We lift our hands to the Lord, and we get on our faces before God. If there's something that our generation needs to do more, it's to be on our face before the Lord, because that communicates something to my own heart, doesn't it? But don't think the Lord's going to hear you better. It's not the outward. It's the inward. It's the posture of our heart. And the point in all of this is simply, as Jesus says in that passage, Luke 18, why play games? Why play games with God? Why pretend that you're something you're not? How freeing is it that moment that you finally get it? And you say, God's not concerned with my performance. 
He's concerned with the purity of my heart, right? The fact that we could fool God is just absurd. He sees you as ugly as you are, and me as well. And yet he loves you, he accepts you, through Christ he cleanses you, and you're accepted, the Bible says, into the beloved. That speaks of intimacy and closeness and fellowship and, and so many other things. That's when the love of God becomes a whole lot more real, right? And this little club that people think we're a part of, man, it's a, it's a whole different dynamic at that point, isn't it? That's when life gets really radical, when our worship of the Lord is sincere and without hypocrisy, without pretense. Don't play a game with the Lord. We don't keep church attendance records, you know that, right? The Lord sees the sincerity of your heart. Keep it clean. Keep yourself clean. Not so others will think better of you, but so you'll have a, a real relationship with the Lord, would you? Amen? Amen? Now we get technical, folks. Are you ready? Now we're digging deep into the well of prophecy. So if this is your thing, man, get set. I hope you're sharp, because we're going to cover a lot of this quickly. Getting back to the context of our chapter, John is told to rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. The temple of God. We look at Jerusalem today and we don't see one, right? And thus this is prophecy. Uh, for John in his day, and you can look into that in your, in your own time, but also for us today. It was destroyed in 70 AD. It doesn't exist any longer. So we're talking about a temple, a fourth temple, some would say third, it doesn't really matter, that is going to be rebuilt where the old one was. Israel will rebuild their temple with the help of Antichrist. It's going to happen. There are those who say it's impossible, it's unlikely, the Bible's wrong, and it's got to be symbolism, and so on and so forth. There are those who will look at this and say the temple of God represents the church. Well, the church is not here, and that just makes no sense. And this chapter is all about Israel. So that just really doesn't add up. As simply as we can read this, we can understand this. This is prophecy. Jesus said, he prophesied firstly the destruction of the temple. Do you remember? Secondly, he prophesied that it would be rebuilt. Paul, the apostle. Daniel, the prophet, all spoke and said there would be a temple in the city of Jerusalem right where the old one used to be in the end times, the last days. It's going to happen and the onset of the Great Tribulation. There's an event that occurs that's key to prophecy. It's the moment in which God's people Israel wake up. It's a radical moment, right? Do you remember when you were not yet saved, and that moment occurred when you got it. It wasn't head information. It wasn't just, you know, something you heard or something uh, uh, that someone else said, but it's something that clicked in your heart and you embraced and you received the gospel. Your eyes were opened. You saw it. You embraced it. You accepted it. Something happened. That moment where God and men meet, it's a mystery. It's amazing. There's a moment like that coming for God's people, Israel. He's not finished with them. He's faithful to them. He's not done with them. He's going to redeem and restore them as he said he would in the Old Testament. There's an event that's going to occur. You can write this down. You should know it as biblical students, the abomination of desolation, or an act that will occur that causes some radical effect effects. Daniel talked about this in 9. You can write this down, Daniel 9. Read all the way through Daniel chapter 12 and you'll refresh yourselves in all the things that we've been discussing prophetically as Daniel predominantly, you know, taught and prophesied about these things. Daniel teaches us that the Antichrist, when he comes on the scene, he's going to do what no one else has ever been able to do. We've talked about this. And that is create peace in the Middle East. The Lord gets specific. He's going to have a seven-year peace treaty that he brokers between Jew and Muslim, and there will be peace halfway through that. How specific can you get, Lord, really? Halfway through that, he's going to break it. 
He's going to set himself up as God in the temple that he'll help the Jews rebuild, proclaim himself to be God, demand to be worshipped as God, we've talked about this, and kill anyone who refuses. That's the moment that Jesus said, the Jews are going to wake up. Something's going to click in them, and they're going to say, we chose the wrong Messiah. It's Jesus, not whoever that person, Antichrist, is going to be. Daniel talks to us about that day, that time, that moment. Jesus, Matthew 24, is where he gives this warning to his people, Israel. Matthew 24 is such a confusing chapter for Christians because we apply it to ourselves. And listen, predominantly, it's Jesus talking to Israel, not to us. And that's important. Context is key, right? But Jesus tells his people when they see this abomination that causes desolation, as Daniel prophesied about, when they see this happen, a man go into the temple and say, I'm God, worship me as God, you're going to wake up. You're going to get it. You're going to know that it's, you know, not legitimate. This man, this person. And you're going to see that it's me. And at that moment, at that time, head for the hills, man, run. And I'll protect you. I'll be with you. We're going to talk about these things in Revelation 12. But that's the sign. That's the season in which all these things are going to happen. In order for that to occur, this temple must be rebuilt. One more passage, 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Paul talks about this as well. He says, To the church, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter, asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. They said it then, they still say it today. These things are all past. The great tribulation, oh, it's already occurred, or we're in the midst of it now. Paul says, no, 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 no. Don't receive it. It's not true. Men are liars, not God. He says, verse 3, don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for listen, that day, and again, the day of the Lord, the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, is what we're talking about here. He says it will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. That word rebellion is interesting in the original Greek. In other translations, it reads, uh, what are some other translations? Help me out, I just had a brain pause. The great falling away, right? In the Greek, it's the word apostasia, and we've interpreted that more commonly to mean something like that, like a great departure or a falling away, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It can also be interpreted rapid departure. Departure. Rapid departure. What does that speak to you uh, of all by itself? That's kind of interesting to me as it pertains to our rapture. That's what the word means, to be taken up, caught away by force. A rapid departure. It's an interesting way to look at the progression of the end times and our being gathered to the Lord, as he says here in verse 1. At any rate, Paul says, don't let anyone deceive you. The tribulation, the day of the Lord, is not going to come until this rapid departure occurs. The man of lawlessness or antichrist is revealed. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up where? In God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. I know it's unlikely. People say it's impossible. It's never going to happen. Listen, men are liars, and God tells the truth. Oftentimes, God bless us, men speak out of our ignorance. And we say, Jew and Muslim, I mean, come on, this is never going to happen. It's never going to occur, because we just don't see it, and we don't get it. But better than our own perspectives we should bank on the word of God. If he says it's going to happen, guys, it's, it's going to happen. And he's laid out for us how all this is going to occur. He's told us plainly, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene after the church has already left. We've talked about this. Peace treaty, all things are hunky-dory, Jew and Muslim. I'm telling you, it's going to occur. The temple dedicated to the Lord, it's not God's temple. The sacrifices that will occur there are an abomination to the Lord. It's not worship. 
But nonetheless, they're going to sacrifice animals once again. Dome of the Rock, pardon me. Temple of God, you like that boom? Dome of the Rock, they're going to sit side by side and everything that we read about in the Scripture is going to occur. For decades now, the Jewish people have been preparing for this moment. They believe without question it's going to happen. They've been assembling all the pieces and parts and training the priests and preparing the animals to be offered. They're ready to go. This will occur. They believe without question that their Messiah, who is yet to come, will lead them in the rebuilding of their temple. And I'm afraid it's not going to be Jesus. But it will be Antichrist, and all these things will happen up until that moment when that abomination occurs and his, his true colors are revealed. And then... Every Jew will see, will know in that time, in that moment, in that season, God is placing pressure. He's working predominantly with his people, Israel. They're going to see it. They're going to get it. What have we done? And wow, they're going to head for the hills as Antichrist then attempts to destroy every single one of them. A lot of preparations are being made. I'm going to paraphrase this particular quote. So as it comes up on the screen, I'm going to start about halfway down but one particular leader in one of these groups that are preparing for the rebuilding of the temple, he said, we shall continue our struggle until the Israeli flag is flying from the Dome of the Rock. That's a radical statement, right? Like we're going to persist in this. We know it's happening. We know it's coming. And so we're going to prepare as though these things uh, are already occurring, as it were powerful statement. These are the preparations that are currently being made. Additional information, verse 2. The Lord says, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But here's something that's interesting that we can add to our prophetic discussion. He says, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Interesting. It could be that we have no idea what in the world this means. Or, as we look at our Bible prophetically, and we look at the world presently, we might be able to put, you know, a couple things together. It's interesting, and if you know geography and history and Israel and so on and so forth, these things will mean something to you. If not, look into them later, because it's important. When the Dome of the Rock, which is one of the key holy sites to the, those of the Muslim faith, uh, is, is built, they believe that it was built on top of the former temple to God um, that existed for the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And it was a statement of triumph, like we've decimated this nation and this God. No temple will ever be rebuilt here to him and we're going to put this holy site, this Dome of the Rock, just to ensure that that never happens. Like, it's like mankind's ultimate statement. Ha-ha! We're going to defeat the Lord, and this stuff's never going to happen. And, well, come to find out, interestingly enough, the site where they thought the temple was and where they built the Dome of the Rock, well, it's not the right site. You know this? It's not new information. It's been around for a little while. A little bit to the north, a little down the line, that's actually where, you know, archaeological evidence would suggest that the original temple, uh, Herod's temple, was built and where it stood. Now, what's interesting is if you, let's say, took the Dome of the Rock here, holy site, Muslim, and just a little bit to the north where they think the temple once stood, you built the temple to the Lord, as it says here, uh, city of Jerusalem, Jewish people, they would stand side by side and the Dome of the Rock would be in the outer court of the temple if it were rebuilt right where it was previously. I mean, that's kind of crazy stuff, right? Does your mind comprehend that? Because it makes my, my head spin a little bit. It's just kind of nuts. First of all, that it uh, has occurred as it has and that it's going to occur just as the Lord says it would and then he can comment about it in such a way here. It's just, wow, it makes the head hurt just a bit, right? And yet, listen, it's all simply seen in this. What the Lord has said will come to pass. It may seem unlikely. Some will say it's impossible. And yet, 
every single time he speaks, we see it perfectly come to pass. Is faith being nurtured? Is it growing in your hearts right now? To see that every single word, every single word that the Lord says will perfectly come to pass just as he says it will. What does this mean? They will tread, the Gentiles will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months? Well, we've already talked about that. Halfway through this seven-year peace treaty, the Antichrist will turn on Israel because they won't bow down and worship. He'll seek to exterminate them. There aren't going to be any Jews left in the temple for the last half of the tribulation. They're gone. They're out of there. There aren't going to be any Jews there, and so it's going to be trampled, and the expression in the Greek means with disdain, trampled underfoot with disdain by the Gentiles who will occupy that area as Jerusalem is the capital of the Antichrist headquarters, as it were. Everything, seemingly a mystery, so very unlikely. Guys, it's going to come to pass perfectly. Radical, right? Amen? Amen? Deep breath. Big deep breaths, come on. Verse 3. And I will give power, the Lord says, to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Two of the most fascinating characters we see in the book of Revelation. Love these guys. The point is, is made again how this period of time, yes, the wrath of God is being poured out. But if the Lord wanted to, the story would just be over, guys. So what's the point? The point is evangelism. The point is we're trying to redeem every soul possible. The point is God is showing himself to be the merciful and gracious God that he is. Who could refuse such a gracious God? Some will, sadly. And we've talked about that. They'll see him clearly and say no. And that's where we're headed towards the end of this chapter. And the Lord will answer that decision. Two witnesses, 1,260 days uh, uh, symbolizing and, and in reality being like Old Testament prophets of old, preaching the gospel. A description's given of these two evangelist witnesses. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he will be killed in this manner. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. What's the point? What's the purpose? Read the Old Testament. This is exciting stuff. Someone said after the first service, I love how many stories are seen in the Old Testament. You know why? Of course you do. Because they really help us get the picture, right? Why don't you read the book of Exodus, uh, uh, Exodus about a man named Moses, right? Whoa. It's kind of like the illustration of what we're seeing here. I mean, we kind of read all about that there. Why don't you read 2 Kings and read about a, a prophet, the greatest of all those Old Testament prophets, Elijah, and how the Lord, you know, used him so greatly to get the attention of the nation of Israel. And he, he, he said there's not going to be any rain for a while. And he called down fire from heaven. I mean, radical guys, great stories, amen? And there's so much of that that's comparable to what we're reading of in regard to these two witnesses here to such an extent that most Bible students will agree that these guys literally are Moses and Elijah. And there's good biblical reason for that. Either way, it's beside the point. The theme of this passage is God's heart, his ministry to his people Israel. Globally, evangelism, the gospel is ha uh, being presented and evangelism is happening, and signs and wonders, these guys are calling down and just crazy things are occurring. It's radical. Every opportunity the world will have to repent, just like it does today. Lots of observations we can make on this passage. Time is short. God help us, right? I think the thing I love the most 
as we observe this passage in regard to these two witnesses is what the Lord says first about them. In regard to verse 4, Zechariah chapter 4 is being referenced here. You can write that down and read it later if you would. The Lord says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. If you know that passage, Zechariah 4, and if you don't, read it. There's powerful imagery being made there in regard to the importance of and how essential it is that we as God's witnesses be filled and be being filled and ongoingly be being filled with his Holy Spirit. That's the whole picture. That's the passage. That's the point. Without question, that is our great need, as the Lord says, even still to us today. We think we're talented. We think we have ability, and maybe we do. But all of that is beside the point. How can you, a physical creature, or me, a carnal guy, how can we touch? How can we affect? How can we move in a powerful way in a spiritual work or realm? Guess what? We can. It's only by the enabling of an almighty God that we can do anything good or effective or right. We said something like this to the first service. Just because I've done something seemingly successful in the past, does that mean that I'll be able to do that same something in the future? Think that through. No. How easy it would be to get up here every Sunday. I know how to study, and I can read the Bible, and I can say super cool stuff. And I, and I attempt to do that. There's a lot of time and a lot of effort and all that other garbage, right? But all of that is nothing compared to the plea. Um, no, I trapped myself. Now I'm talking about myself. I'll get honest for a minute then. All of that preparation and prayer and hard work is just kicked to the curb in that moment where we <laughs> are going to occupy a place to deliver the Word of God. It's got to be, it has to be the Spirit of God working through the Word of God or what is the point? We can manipulate, we can trick, we can deceive. I pray you're aware of some of these tactics used in churches today. What a, what a waste of time. I have a sales and marketing background. If you can relate to that, well, you know what I'm talking about. We get you before you even walk in the door, putty in our hands. Any of those things as carnal and fleshly and just reprehensible as they can be, they have no place in a spiritual work, in a, in a house that we would call the Lord's. And all the preparation, all the prayer, and all the work, it's got to be set aside, that desperation, that prayer, as you enter into your realms of ministry, your spheres of influence. And Lord, this conversation I'm a, that I'm about to have, it's, it's got to be empowered by your spirit. I've got words and I've got thoughts, but who cares, Lord? I'm desperate for your empowering right here and right now. We are physical beings called to do a spiritual work. That's impossible. Do we know this? It's impossible. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's how we do something good. That's how we do something lasting. That's how the Lord does something that's everlasting through people like us. And that's my favorite observation about these two guys. They're perpetually filled with the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the Lord, the discernment of God. These guys are with it. The Lord's powerfully, successfully using them, and, and so much more. It's radical, and there's great lesson for us in that observation. A lot that we could make mention of. We're short on time, verse 7. When they finish their testimony, can you say those five words, please? When they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, we've talked about him, it's Antichrist, Satan himself. He'll make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And you're like, what? Wait, huh? Am I reading the Bible here? I mean, where's the... This has got to be wrong. Is this a translational error? Like, 
<laughs> What's the deal with that? They should just be finished and then raptured, perfection, prosperity, I mean, positivity. Uh, What's the deal with this? The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome, and kill them? I mean, am I missing something here? Aren't these the guys that can, like, breathe fire out of their mouth, and anyone who tries to hurt or or come against them, they're like, ah, and they're dead? Like Indiana Jones kind of thing? Sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, Divine protection? Uh, Am I missing something here? Maybe. The success of their ministry is not seen in the signs and wonders and divine prosperity and protection and fire breathing, but it would seem as we read the rest of this passage, the triumph of their ministry, the success of their ministry is in laying down their lives. And that's what we see as we simply read this passage. That just, that hits me in a way that I need to be hit quite often. As strange as it may seem, Sunday's coming. You get that joke? Yeah, you do. So these guys are overcome and killed. Verse 8, their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called, it's called Jerusalem, but spiritually it's called Sodom, sexual immorality, Egypt, slavery, oppression where also our Lord was crucified. This just gets weirder and weirder. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations, the whole globe, guys, will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, and send gifts to one another, because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. Interesting. I don't think this is unrelatable. I don't think that, you know, this is too hard to grasp or consider. I think as we see the character and nature of man clearly revealed in the scripture, as we look around the world today, this is just not that hard to to figure out and not that difficult to understand. Amen? Amen? Jesus talked about John chapter 3. Write that down. The deal with those who reject the gospel in Jesus Christ. Those who live and love darkness, they hate the light. It exposes that their deeds are evil. They will not come to the light. And I think we can pull a, a parallel from that. They'll do anything they can to snuff out that light. And that's what we're seeing here. We see that in the world today. What I love about this passage is seen in verse 7 when they finish their testimony. All this occurs, and yet, as they lay their lives down, we see that the Lord is still at work. Someone said, praise God, we cannot be taken off this earth until we finish our testimony." The devil does not have power over our lives. We are witnesses of the Lord, and he will protect us until our testimony is finished. Someone else said we're invincible as Christians. Do you know that? Invincible. Until the time comes when the Lord is done with us and our work is finished, and when it is, I tell you what, go ahead and send me home. I don't want to be here a second longer then the Lord would have me be. How about you? When their testimony is finished, well, these guys are slain, they're martyred for the world to see, rejoicing, gift-giving. I mean, this is crazy, just horrific and satanic and every other such thing. They parade their bodies, their dead bodies, the celebrations occurring, and the whole world is watching. Now, Again, there was a time when we read a verse like this, even decades ago, and we said, as people, the church, society, whatever, we said things like, there the Bible goes again, predicting things about the future that are completely impossible. Because everyone knows there can never be one event that the whole world watches at once. You with that? Now, We, who have our smartphones in our pockets, and hopefully we're not, like, using them now, but 
We laugh at statements like that because they're absurd, but it's just all about perspective, isn't it? That's why we need a perspective of faith, because still there are verses that we could read and say, well, that's impossible, you know, that, that could never occur, technology will never get there, or God could never, and, and all these kinds of things. It's nothing. We look at that and it's nothing. For one event to be broadcast around the world, everyone to see, well, they said it was impossible, but I, I tell you what, it's not impossible anymore. Just as the Lord says it, guys. Whether we understand it or can grasp it, it will occur. So this is radical, and there's a lot that could be said. Our time is, is over and we're short. I pray you look into these things a little more fully, kind of dive into the picture here and kind of the, the sickness in man and the, the hardness of our heart and just how crazy this is. Preaching the gospel of Christ, showing evidence that they truly represent God, and yet they hate these two witnesses. To such a point, they murder them and their bodies are left out and they think the story's over. But, verse 11, and we'll bring this to a close. After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. That statement means so much to me this week and this morning. I pray that you can pull something from it. I pray that it's something you can ask of God for. The breath of life from God entered them and they stood on their feet. That's got to be a daily occurrence for me. How about you? And there's a reaction, there's a response from the whole watching world. And this is the moment that this is all about, right? After the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. They stood on their feet and great fear fell on all those who saw them. You better believe it did, right? And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. I want to read this to you. I loved what one author wrote in regard to this passage. These witnesses are examples of what you can be in the last days in which we live. You're to share the gospel with people. Yes, you'll be beat up emotionally and verbally, ostracized, left out, not invited to the party. But do you know what will happen? Three and a half days later, you'll rise. There will be a spring in your step and joy in your heart as you find yourself soaring emotionally. Truly, there is nothing, nothing, nothing like sharing your faith. Even if you're put down, beat up, left out, you'll find yourself revived. Something else that we can pull from this passage, I think, that's a simple, uh, uh, essential. The last thing on earth we want to do as Christians is suffer. Amen? I mean, come on. Absolutely, the last thing on earth we want to do is suffer, lay our lives down for someone else. That is really hard to do. To put their needs, wants, desires above my own, to just cram my flesh and myself down, and to serve, foot washing kind of stuff, whatever the case may be. To lay our lives down, even to suffer to the, the, the point of death, as we say, as we see here, for someone in our lives who needs Jesus. And yet, as we see so clearly here, the Lord uses uh, selfless actions like these as his most successful form of ministry. It's not how prosperous we are in the eyes of the world. It's not how mightily we move in the power of the Holy Spirit and calling down fire from heaven and all these kinds of signs and wonders and every other such thing. It's the simple things, isn't it? I don't want to suffer. I don't want to prefer others. I don't want to do the small things in life that are the more successful. I want to kind of hold it all back for that one grand gesture and then I'm out with a bang, right? No, but it's just the simple things. It's the way in which we can suffer in front of someone else. It's how they can see the Lord restore and revive and see consistency in our faith. The world is watching and they will see Jesus. And that's what we see in this passage. Wrapping this up, verse 13 and 14, and we're done. In the same hour as, as these guys are resurrected to life, as the voices heard, come up here. You remember Revelation 4.1? 
Same expression, right, in regard to our rapture as the church. It's powerful. These guys have their own little rapture experience. Come up here and whoosh, and everyone's watching. In the same hour, and this would seem to be a divine response to what's just occurred, these men being killed and, and thrown out in the street for three and a half days, resurrection called to heaven, there's a response from heaven that we now see, and it's as if this period of pause is over. You remember that? This period of pause that we're in, the gospel and evangelism, and the Lord's making points, powerful points, but it's on once more. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. You ain't seen nothing yet. The third woe is coming. Amen? Father, we read these things, and oftentimes they're hard to relate to. We see the hardness of heart that exists in our world, in those that you love, and it's just... God, it's hard to comprehend how they can see you, give glory to you as God, and yet not surrender their life to you. If there is something we need, it's power today, Lord. What's to be done with hearts like ours? How do we pry our way into people's lives with love in order to shine the light of the gospel? Would your spirit speak to us right now? Would you communicate how simply and successfully we can see, Lord, those with the hardest of hearts in our lives saved? Ultimately, we know that it's a choice they make privately before you. God, we are committing ourselves to influencing that choice as, as much as we possibly can. Lord, I think you're calling us to hard things this morning. Not grand things, glorious gestures, but hard, simple, small sacrifices. The things that generally can make the greatest difference upon a person's heart and their mind and their life cause them to see you and have the opportunity to receive you. Holy Spirit, as we commit ourselves as ambassadors of Christ, light and soul, would you creatively give us that insight that we need? Here's our mind, here's our hands, here's our feet, here's our wallet. Lord, use us God, to successfully usher those that you love into eternity alongside, Lord, the rest of your people. Get our eyes, God, on the simple, small things. Thank you that the greatest witness to others is a sanctified life. a life that's set apart completely to you. God, we're not professing to be perfect, but we are practicing toward perfection. Without question, there's room for us to grow and increase in our practice. And we pray for that today. Do the soles of my feet match the profession of my mouth? Help us, Lord. Whatever's going to work, God, as we wiggle our way into the lives of those that you love, give us that inspiration, we pray. We're not going to rely upon techniques, not going to have scripts written out, but Lord, we're going to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. We're going to rely upon your power and ask for it every single day. Lord, if you're working this hard to save souls, God, help us to see it and to seek the same. Thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your word this morning together. Would this word produce good fruit in our lives? 
Would it help us to change? Get back on course? Be sharpened again and engage in service once more? Teach and train our kids and pass on, Lord, your, your heart for the world? Would our faith be built up this morning in a fresh and new way as we see that the Word is sure and steadfast? Could we look in the eyes of those who doubt you and speak with confidence and faith because we know that you can't fail? These things and so many more, God. What a privilege we have to walk with you, to know you, Lord, to experience this life with you. Lord, and to just pass on all that stuff to those who know you and those who don't. Polish us up today. Shine from our hearts. Lord, and would we be uh, those trophies of grace that you've made us to be. That your body and your blood, Lord Jesus, has enabled us to be. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your people, patience with their long-winded pastor. In Jesus' name, amen. And we say, amen. 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 Let's stand together. God bless you in your week. Remember, bring someone one service next week, 11 o'clock. You better come early and get a seat because they'll fill up and then that's all. At any rate, bring someone with you. Good Friday, 7 p.m. if you'd like some prayer. We'll have some elders up front to minister to you. God bless.